Orchid for Funders webinar. Uh, my name is Natasha Simons and I'm a Senior Data Management Specialist with the Australian National Data Service or ANS for short and I'd like to introduce my co-organiser for this webinar, um, Nabucco Mieri, uh, who is the Regional Director of Orchid in the Asia Pacific and she is based in Tokyo. So today's webinar looks at the role that Orchid can and does play for research funders. And this webinar is designed to connect research funders who are integrating ORCID identifiers or who are looking to do so. We have in attendance research funders from Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Canada and the USA. We have three excellent speakers at this webinar today. Josh Brown, who's the Director of Partnerships for ORCID. Sarah Townsend, who's the Senior Advisor in the Ministry of Business Innovation or, and Employment, known as MBIE in New Zealand. And Sarah was formerly the research funding analyst for the Research Council's UK Executive Directorate. And Dr Richard Ikeda, who's Director of Office of Research Information Systems and Research Condition and Disease Categorization in the National Institutes of Health USA, who's coming to us from Washington or just outside of Washington DC. And after each speaker, we'll look to see if there are any questions. And then at the end of all the talks, we will have some open mic time for everyone to have a say about anything you wish to discuss. I would just like to hand over to our first speaker, Josh Brown, who's Director of Partnerships at ORCID. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, as Natasha said, I'm Josh Brown. I'm ORCID's Director of Partnerships. Before that, I worked for ORCID, um, heading up their membership outreach and support in Europe. Uh, and I've worked in a variety of projects with partners in Europe. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here today and to talk a little bit about the work that we have been doing with funders. I'm not sure what everybody's familiarity is with ORCID, so um, I'm just going to start with a few introductory slides. Um, forgive me if you've seen these or something similar before, but it's just good to make sure that we're all, we're all at the same level of understanding where we, as we begin. So, what is ORCID? We'll start with the basics. ORCID, an ORCID ID is an identifier for researchers. It's a unique identifier that complements their name. It can be attached to their research outputs, uh, to their funding, to a lot of their activities. And it helps us to disambiguate people. Sometimes there are circumstances where a person's name may change in their life. Uh, their, the way their name is recorded may change. There may be accents or changes of language that mean that the, the name is transliterated, and this can lead to confusion. You will, this doesn't even take account of the circumstances where researchers may share a name. Um, ORCID is a registry where the identifiers and identifying information about researchers is recorded and is made publicly available. We also provide a set of standard procedures uh, for connecting researchers. This means that funders, publishers, universities and others can build ORCID IDs into their workflows and actually connect researchers to their work while the work is being done. We can do this because we work with a global community of research practitioners, uh, investigators, policy makers, technicians and others to build connectors, to integrate ORCID IDs into workflows and to put identifiers at the fingertips of people who are performing research and analysing it. We managed to gather this kind of level of collaboration and community because we are an open organisation, we are international scale and we are built on collaboration and cooperation. We are united by our vision which is uh, as expressed here is a world where all who participate in research, scholarship and innovation are uniquely identified and connected to their contributions and affiliations. So that's their contributions might be data visualization, it might be writing a journal article or a monograph or editing a book. Their affiliations could be education, where you did your PhD, or they could be where you're employed or have been employed in the past. This is crucial that we, we connect this across time, so throughout the researcher's career, across disciplines because research is interdisciplinary, people may change disciplines through their career, and the whole research enterprise is valuable and of course borders because research is international. As you can see, so is our community. We have more than 3.1 million researchers who have registered for an ORCID identifier. Uh, we have more than 620 members from 40 countries 
uh, from all around the world, uh, including many national consortia, including um, the national consortia in Australia and the Netherlands, um, and in the UK and a no number of other countries in Europe. And we're currently exploring um, the launch of a number of further national, uh, national consortia. So this slide will change in the very near future. And together, these organizations have produced more than 250 integrations. Now, some of these are in local systems that are used at one institution. Some of them are in platforms or services that are used by hundreds, or in some cases, thousands of organizations. So the reach of these integrations is, is absolutely enormous. As you can see, the bulk of our integrations come from research institutions, which is where most of the research takes place. And our second largest group are publishers. Funders make up 5% of our integrations. But again, I would imagine that a lot of the researchers um, from the 62% of our integrations from research institutions will be interacting with funder systems at one time or another, or we would hope anyway. One thing that's very interesting about the scope of these is that actually they are becoming required for use in some systems. Here you see an example of the mandate that was introduced uh, just over a year ago, um, where a number of publishers said that they would start requiring ORCID IDs from corresponding authors for every article they published in their journals. Now, this number has continued to grow in the last year, um, and so far it has been actually quite a popular innovation. As this inset quote from Brooks Hansen from the AGU says, out of ten, more than 10,000 authors who have used this, one has complained about this new, this new requirement. And the value of this is not just that the, risk that the publishers were asking or demanding ORCID IDs, it's actually that they have committed to a, a minimum level of integration. It means that they're not just collecting the ORCID identifiers, they are keeping that ORCID identifier connected to the manuscript through the whole publication process. Uh, they're, pr they're putting it in the PDF, they're putting it in the web page, and they're making it available publicly in a machine readable and human readable way when the article is published. Now the value of that is that it enables new workflows when you know that idea is going to be there. One example of this is what we call the ORCID Auto Updates. Um, the workflow for this is very simple. Um, the author uses their ID uh, when, they, when they submit a manuscript. The publisher ensures that the ORCID ID is there in the metadata and in the file and on the web page. When they mint a DOI, a digital object identifier for that article when it's published, Crossref, the service that many publishers use to do this, will detect the ORCID identifier and then they will push the, public, the citation information for the, for the new publication straight into the author's ORCID record. The value of that is it means that it can go to any system that is looking at the ORCID record or is connected to it. That might be the institutional repository at the author's home institution. It might be a funder reporting system. The value of this is that it means that any of these systems that are connected receive an automatic update and the citation for that publication. It means researchers don't have to go and tell you about that publication, and it means that everywhere that that citation travels, that, that ID is linked to it, so attribution becomes more accurate, and bibliometric statistics, citations, and other analytics become more accurate. So one of the reasons that we think funders care about ORCID IDs is that there are a number of ways that they can be used to improve the efficiency of research processes and to reduce the burden on researchers of research administration and organization. So, for example, you could streamline the application process by pulling a list of publications or employment information from a researcher's ORCID record. Once they sign in, and then you can ask for permission to add information to their record and to pull information from their record. If you push that information to the record, you can ensure the accurate citation of a grant award. So you can put your organization name, you can put any information about the funding program or grant numbers in there. Once that's in the ORCID record, it's then available to others to use, including the researcher's home institution. You can have real-time reporting by using our, our notification API. And, and this is one thing that we think is really, really valuable, is you can recognize your reviewers too. The workflow for recognizing reviewers is very similar. You may, you know, the flow here is very similar to the auto update slide, but it's it really we think it's really valuable because 
reviewers are performing a valuable task in ensuring the health of their discipline. It's a voluntary contribution in many cases. There is prestige attached to it. Uh, but making sure that these researchers get recognition for their, for their contribution to the health of their discipline is vital. And this is one way to do it. Um, it's very simple, the same way the research, a researcher comes to review grant applications, they provide their ORCID ID by signing in and sending it via our API so there are no mistakes, no one's typing in the, the ID or copying and pasting it. The funder can then embed the re reviewer's ORCID ID in the review and then use the ORCID ID number and that API connection that's been created when the researcher signs in to push a review acknowledgement to the, to the, to the reviewer's ORCID record. From there it can flow to institutional systems and also maybe other funders can see that this, fund, that this researcher has worked for your funding organisation when they apply for funds later. Other funders who are very quick to recognise this include the Wellcome Trust in the UK um, and there, this quote from Jonathan Cram I think demonstrates uh, the, the, the perceived value, the potential um, of these unique identifiers for people which is that they can enable these forms of real-time uh, understanding uh, of an analytics and appreciation of scientific research efforts, collaborations, careers and contributions that up till now have been, well, in many cases have been impossible to collect. Many funders around the world um, are, inter are interacting with ORCID IDs. Some are requiring them for their grantees. Um, I think some of the early ones were uh, the FCT in Portugal or Autism Speaks in the USA uh, who, who, who introduced their policies in 2014. Um, we've had a number of health funders who moved, moved ahead with those in, in 2015 and more funders around the world have come on board during 2016. I think it's really crucial that these IDs are not just asked for, they are used and using them in the grant management systems, using them for downstream reporting is a really, really valuable way of helping researchers and ensuring that your systems are talking efficiently to other systems. I won't go into much detail about this, but I think one of the ways that many, many research funders have joined is as part of these national consortia I mentioned earlier. One of the benefits of this is that the cost comes down from an individual organization. Um, the cost of membership is higher. Um, where you get an economy of scale when we have a consortium membership. So it keeps to help, it helps to reduce the, the price and it helps to um, demonstrate for funders that they are part of the community in that consortium um, and they get local support, show common cause with their community and it, we find that um, it actually means that the local institutions are more likely to choose to interact with ORCID IDs coming between the systems when they're part of a common organisation working together defining how they would like to use ORCID IDs. Getting started with using ORCID IDs is very simple. If you have a grant management system, you can integrate it, um, set up a webinar with our talk team, um, decide how and when you would like to use ORCID IDs. Is it during applications? Is it for reviewers? Um, can you pull information from the ORCID record to make it more efficient? Can you collect permissions to push information into the ORCID record? If you do that, then you can push awards, you can push reviews and you can continue uh, to access the researcher's ORCID record and to pull updates from that, again making research reporting that much easier for your researchers. Technically it's actually pretty simple. We use two standard web technologies, OAuth for authentication and REST for API calls. These are well known, if your developers will be familiar with these and comfortable with using them. Integrating um, a, a field for a, an identifier and the source of that, that, of, of, that, of that information to your database, again, is not a difficult task. Uh, but I think the second point here, socially, it is absolutely vital that researchers are engaged in the process, so be prepared to communicate. I think that's much more challenging than the technical implementation. Uh, we do provide a lot of support both for tech, the technical aspects of this using our APIs, we have detailed and open documentation, but we also provide a lot of support in communicating with researchers, examples where other funders have engaged with their researchers, case studies of what they have done. So if you have any questions, going to members.orchid.org is a great way to, to, to start looking for answers. 
and of course our support team are always available. Um, we've also launched a program called Collect and Connect. This is to make sure that researchers always have a familiar experience when they encounter an ORCID. They understand how it's being used and it's very easy for integrators, whatever the system they are using, to communicate to researchers why they're using ORCID IDs and how they're using ORCID IDs. We think this familiarity and this consistent experience will really help researchers to understand and encourage them to engage uh, with, with this initiative. But crucially, uh, this is my last slide, but um, I just want to finish on a few points. And I think that don't underestimate the power that funders have to drive good practice, to change behavior for the better, to, to lead by example by increasing the efficiency of research communication and the communication between systems and between people to share that data by making funding and grant award information publicly available on an open system, that data is available for reuse. By pulling data in from open community systems like ORCID, reusing that data, it adds efficiency, it means the data is cleaner because it's not being typed in. And I think, and this goes back to the point I made a few slides ago about communication, tell the community what data you need them to be providing to you and listen to their needs. Um, so that you can start pushing information out. That way it's a two-way flow, uh, it's, it's seen as a partnership, and it helps to cement that good practice and the benefits of unique identifiers for researchers across the whole research ecosystem. Thanks very much, Josh, for that excellent overview of ORCID and how funders can make best use of its functionality. Um, we, there are no questions in the question pod for the moment. Uh, so I think we might move on to our next speaker, who is Sarah Townsend from MBIE in New Zealand. As Natasha already said, I'm currently um, at MB in New Zealand, which is quite convenient for this webinar, um, as most of my UK colleagues are probably asleep right now. Um, but I did um, formally work for Research Councils UK um, and finished there in December. I'm going to talk to you a bit about RCUK's integration with ORCID, um, what we did, how we did it, and I'll um, outline some of the challenges that we faced along the way. So yeah, I'm going to start off with the timeline of how we got to where we are now. So um, a key date for us was June 2015, and this is when the UK ORCID Consortium was launched by JISC in the UK. So there'd been lots of discussions prior to this time, um, but this was a good moment um, to really get things moving. Um, and the UK ORCID Consortium has offered reduced membership fees for, for universities in the UK, um, but Ask UK also made use of that and became a member under that consortium. So shortly after that point, um, in December 2015, um, UK finally became members of ORCID after having talked about it for quite some time. Um, and that was important because obviously it gave us access to the member API, um, and allowed us to actually get the work done um, to integrate ORCID with our grant system, which is called JES, uh, which stands for the Joint Electronic Submission System. So we finally um, got that integration live in May 2015. And so the JES system is used by the vast majority of applicants applying to the research councils for funding. Um, so most of our researchers will come through that platform. Um, the important thing to note there is that we actually integrated um, ORCID at the accounts up stage. Um, and the reason why that was important is it actually means that, for one, you don't have to wait until someone's coming to apply for a research grant. They can actually log in um, at any point and add and connect their ORCID ID to their JES account. But it also means that then that information will proliferate across any activity um, that those researchers have had in our system. So whether they've been reviewers for us, whether they've applied to us in the past, that's all captured with that one um, integration. And then to take that a step further, in October 2015, we started publishing ORCID IDs in the RCUK Gateway to Research. So the Gateway to Research is a public website um, accessible to anyone. You can log on there and you can see information about um, anything that the research councils have funded. So by pushing the ORCID IDs out through GTR, we're now connecting that information against all of the grant details that are out there publicly already. And that's for awards um, against researchers 
on a number of roles. So if they're a co-investigator, a fellow, a training grant holder, student or supervisor, that all displays in the gateway to research. And I'll show you a slide later on actually so you can see that how that looks in our system. So this should um, make our funded researchers activities much easier to discover we hope. So this is actually how the integration with our grant system looks. So um, at the top level there you've got GERS requesting permission from the user for the following scopes. And whilst we're only collecting the authenticated ORCID ID at this point, we do also collect the permission tokens for um, pushing and pulling data um, as well, because the, the plan and obviously the ambition is that later down the line, we will build more workflows to be able to actually pull data in and to push to ORCID records. So it made sense to us to collect that all in one go. Um, and we felt that our users would be more um, accepting of that than having to go back out to them once we've developed further workflows. So as you can see, that then um, means that within the grant system, we hold the actual ORCID ID itself and the authentication code for those requested scopes above. That then gets pushed out to our publicly facing website um, through our reporting tools. So that's where we are now. So this next slide shows kind of where we want to be in the future. So obviously a key thing for us in next steps is actually pushing authenticated grant information um, to our users' ORCID records. I will go in when I talk a bit more about the challenges. We have faced quite a few challenges in that our IT infrastructure is quite out of date. So it's not um, as smooth a road as we would like to be able to do that push of information. So at the moment, it's something we very much want to do, but we're still trying to work out exactly how to do that. Um, the other slight complication that we have is between JES and GTR, we do do some manipulation with the data, so there may be some records that we need to keep um, confidential. So we do want to make sure that anything that is displayed within the ORCID registry reflects what we already have publicly um, on our gateway to research site. We did quite a lot of um, communications to promote our integration with ORCID. Um, as you can see, this is the, um, a page on the RCK website, and there's links there to a number of blog posts that we wrote at the time. Um, so this was just to really warm both the researchers and the research organisations up to the fact that this was coming um, and allow them to have a bit of lead-in time to prepare for that going live. And one of the good things that we did within those communications was try and get um, a researcher's view of actually what they saw the benefits um, of ORCID ID to be. Um, and this has kind of been a theme through um, all of RCK's approach to integrating with ORCID is about demonstrating those benefits to researchers, as well as obviously we know as funders that we will take a lot of benefit from um, ORCID in the long term. We really wanted to show that this was a researcher-led initiative, um, and I think this case study helped to illustrate that, and I think more case studies like this would be really useful. So here's just a few figures. So in terms of research councils, we put out about three billion in research funding each year. Um, and that's across all of the academic disciplines from the arts and humanities through to medical, biological, environmental, social. Um, we handle about 7,000 applications per year across those disciplines, and that results in about 2,500 research awards being granted. So then looking at our ORCID integration, we already have 11,620 ORCID IDs connected to contacts in our grant system. So that represents ORCID IDs on about 20% of all of our data held in that system um, and about 4% of all funded awards because obviously we have ORCID IDs um, against unfunded awards and also against reviewers and any other activity that takes place within that system. Um, so then looking at how um, that's represented in the Gateway to Research, we have 2,430 people with an ORCID ID published in the Gateway to Research. Um, and this means that an ORCID ID is actually associated with 7,130 projects in GTR and around over 56,000 research outcomes. So I think the numbers that we're seeing are quite positive. So this is just to give you a feel for how that actually looks in the Gateway to Research. So as you see, we've got um, some information about um, a researcher here, and you'll see their ORCID ID displayed on the screen alongside their name. Um, and it's important that that's a hyperlink as well. So that would actually take you, um, anyone on the website, straight to this person's 
ORCID record um, on the ORCID website. It's important to have that link through. So this is another screen from the Gateway to Research. Um, and by holding the ORCID ID at the person account level in our system, we're able to connect that person to all the interactions they've had with the research councils. So this also means that when their ID is published in the Gateway to Research, we get a public picture of all the funding they've received, including legacy data. So in this example, I use Professor Donison's ORCID ID to, to search the GTR database. Um, and these results show me that he's had a very active career going right back to 2006. He's been involved with 39 projects from three different funders, um, three different research councils, 17 times as a, as a principal investigator, 15 times as a co-investigator, and seven times as a training grant holder. He's associated with 345 outcomes as a result of those awards. Um, and this is all information that I'm able to drill down more into by clicking on the links in GTR. If I want to find out more. So this all starts to build a picture of a person's research career and their connections to other people involved with those awards and research outcomes that have been delivered from those grants. And this information is all publicly available um, and can also be exported um, through CSV for further analysis. I wanted to give you some information about the types of people that are connecting their ORCID ID with our grant system. Um, I'll talk a bit more about mandate versus no mandate later on, but the approach that research councils have taken is to widely encourage the uptake of ORCIDs um, at this stage rather than make it a mandatory requirement. So therefore it's quite important, well quite useful to look at actually who is um, chosen to connect their ORCID ID with our system. So looking at this slide, um, we can see that the largest proportion of role types with an ORCID ID are current principal investigators, which is perhaps not surprising given that they make up a large majority of our applicants. But if we actually look at the percentage of each role type of people who have an ORCID ID for that role type versus those that don't, we see that researcher co-investigators and fellows are far more likely to have connected their ORCID ID with the GES system. So looking at discipline, and this data was taken directly from the Gateway to Research, showing principal applicants by research council with an ORCID ID as a percentage of all the records that we hold in GTR. Um, and this slide shows us that uptake is most significant amongst principal applicants in the science and technology and the biological and biosciences and nat natural environment discipline areas. Um, and the uptake appears to be lowest amongst applicants in the economic and social research. So I did take a look also at age and gender and primarily that there, is, there isn't a huge um, amount to be said about who is connecting ORCID IDs by age and gender. Um, the differences are quite quite small. Um, but looking at our data, the average age of researcher co-investigators who've connected their ORCID IDs with JES is around 38 years old, compared to PIs who are about 45 years old on average, so not a huge difference. And similarly, um, looking at the percentage of um, women that have connected an ORCID ID to JES versus the percentage of men that can have connected their ORCID ID to JERS and those that haven't, um, we don't see a huge amount of difference there. So it seems that actually career stage and the type of discipline that you're in has the biggest impact on whether or not you're likely to have connected your ID to JERS at this stage, whilst it's not a mandatory requirement. So we might be able to use this information, for example, to do some more targeted comms in those discipline areas that are more underrepresented. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we encountered. So the big question is around whether or not to mandate. So this was one of the more difficult issues that we had to address. Um, firstly, we had to consider what mandating ORCID really meant for us. So for, for us UK, it meant that as a condition of applying for funding from us UK, through our online grant submission system, applicants would have been required to have an ORCID ID. So when a re researcher registers for an ORCID ID, they consent to the processing of their data. Um, if our, we, we took the stance, if RCK as a funder mandated that all applicants must, must register for an ORCID ID in order to obtain funding from us, that it could be argued that it would not always be possible to establish the consent of the researcher to be freely given. Um, other questions we had were, um, should we apply this to all of our funds? Should we apply this to all applicants or just principal applicants? Um, so there were lots of questions that we had to think through. We, we were obviously recognised the 
benefits in mandating um, ORCID in that we would have seen a sharp uptake um, of ORCID IDs um, and it also would have meant the data in DTR was much more comprehensive. Um, so on balance, it's not a decision that we took lightly. We considered many angles of the argument and we also sought legal advice on the data protection issues. Um, at this stage, we took the decision not to make it a mandatory requirement. We felt that at this stage, whilst the benefits to researchers are still slightly further away, um, that the, it was not a proportionate um, approach to take. But in the meantime, we felt it was more appropriate to focus on promoting and encouraging the uptake of ORCID IDs by developing workflows that will create benefits and short-term benefits and contribute towards some of the longer-term goals that we hope to see. In that way, we hope the researchers will feel more engaged and continue to make connections between their ORCID ID and the systems they interact with. Um, we felt strongly that it's not enough for researchers to simply claim an ID. We obviously want to encourage them to use it, and we felt our ability to influence that could be degraded if they felt in any way disengaged. So we're seeing, but we're seeing some really positive numbers in terms of ORCID IDs being connected, um, as I've already shown you, without a mandate. Um, and there are, there are other things happening in the UK that may have an impact on this. So the Higher Education Funding Council for England um, is currently consulting on how to implement the Next Research Excellence Framework, which is broadly equivalent to the ERA in Australia and the PBRF in New Zealand. Um, and one of the questions on that consultation is welcoming views on arguments for and against mandating ORCID. So it'll be interesting to see the results from that consultation. Um, effectively, if, ORCID, if HEFCI decides to mandate ORCID, then it will encompass the vast majority of Research Council researchers anyhow, um, and we would expect to see fairly comprehensive coverage across the UK research base as a result. Um, but it's also worth noting that the next REF, REF exercise won't run until 2021, so we shouldn't um, obviously rest on our laurels until then. So the other major hurdle that we encountered was limitations with our current IT estate, which I alluded to earlier. That estate is quite out of date, and we found that it would have been very costly and time consuming to get our current system to be able to provide the sort of system interoperability that we wanted to be able to deliver. Um, it's something that Research Councils UK are still grappling with. Um, we've yet to determine a clear solution, but we're continuing to explore different avenues. Um, for example, looking at whether we can create a module that sits between GTR um, and ORCID that can do the push of data. But we're pleased with what's been developed to date, and we hope we can continue to build on that, particularly the push of data from RCK to ORCID, which is a clear um, goal that we would like to deliver. So just some things that I would share based on RCK's experience. Um, so the first thing is about keeping things simple and prioritizing requirements. Um, I think what I saw with RCK is that in the initial excitement about ORCID and all the things we could do with it, we perhaps lacked some clarity, and that meant that we dragged our heels a little bit, and it took us a, a bit longer to kind of become members and build the integration um, than we'd have liked. But once we were able to focus down to a single system and aim to start capturing just the authenticated IDs in the first instance, um, we were able to make good progress after that time. So I would just say think about what you want to achieve and try and break it up into manageable chunks. We started with the collection of authenticated IDs and we then moved on to publishing them. And the next logical step for us would be writing grant information to ORCID um, and further down the line looking to read data from ORCID to reuse in grant applications. So the other tip I'd have is to make sure you've thought through what your next steps are going to be up front. So whilst we've not developed the functionality to read or write data from ORCID as yet, we wanted to make sure that we'd collected those permission scopes um, in the initial integration. Um, as I said earlier, we felt users would be more likely to accept that in one go rather than in dribs and drabs. So we've essentially kept the door open to be able to do this upstream without having to go back out to researchers again. We found that there were a few things that we had to rework as and when we realized kind of what we wanted to implement. So just to think through what you think that end goal is going to be um, and make sure that you build that up front. So the third um, tip that I would have is around building workflows that actually create benefits for researchers. So I think, um, and this sort of mirrors some of what Josh said in his slides, but as funders, along with publishers, research organizations, and others, we're authoritative sources of information. So 
So we should all focus on building workflows that can push this information to ORCID. If we all make a concerted effort to put in place the infrastructure to make those connections across the system, we'll all benefit in the longer term and we can start to pull information for analysis and reuse um, further down the line. So my final tip is around talking to the community and telling them what you're up to. So a big piece of feedback we have from research offices in the UK um, was to give them a decent lead in time before we announced our ORCID integration. So the universities have a big role to play in encouraging their academics to get an ORCID ID and they also wanted to be in a position where they could build ORCID integration into their own back office systems. So we were able to help them prepare for the RTK integration by letting them know early that we were working towards this um, and send out signals for when they would expect this to go live. So I think ORCID is a community effort. Um, I'd encourage more events like this webinar so that funders can discuss opportunities and barriers in integrating with ORCID um, and share those amongst us um, and talk about how we can accelerate the adoption and use of ORCID IDs. So in the UK, there's been several um, consortium meetups um, and these have been a good vehicle for hearing about the progress being made um, and the types of issues that people are encountering. Um, and I think there's more that we can do in that space. So I will finish there and hand back over to Natasha. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a very comprehensive and well-considered presentation. Um, there is one question in the question pod from Jason Gush. Uh, so Jason, we might just unmute you. Um, and you can ask your question if you have access to a microphone. That's the light we're watching, thank you. Uh, Sarah, you mentioned that RCUK has sought legal advice about the FA. Can a yeah. member of the team tell us anything about what that advice has resulted in the UK context? Yeah, so um, I've, I've actually got some of it in front of me, which is useful. Um, I think essentially what I would say is this isn't black and white, it's a grey area. Um, so the, the legal advice certainly didn't tell us that we couldn't mandate ORCID by any means. In fact, I think in the end our decision was more driven by wanting to incentivise and encourage um, researchers to get engaged with this initiative. Um, and feeling that whilst we were just collecting the IDs um, in a closed off system that you know we weren't really able to demonstrate the benefits. But the key areas that we asked for legal advice on was around consent for how a person's data will be processed um, in that that should be freely given, specific and informed. The um, feedback they gave us is that where a researcher, can their only source of funding that is available could be argued that that's Research Councils UK, then you could say that it would be difficult to ascertain that their consent was freely given. Um, even then, having said that, um, they also, the advice um, essentially said that the data being shared is minimal, um, it's not sensitive or personal data. So the overall view was that processing does not unfairly prejudice the researchers' rights um, and that this would be, this would constitute a legitimate interest so, as I say, kind of not completely um, black and white there, but they certainly weren't advising us that we couldn't do it. Um, the other area that we specifically sought advice in was the safe harbour regime, um, to which the feedback, and obviously things have moved on since we originally got this, but the feedback was that it's not recommended that the safe harbour is used as an avenue of protection for transfers of data outside the EEA. So this was obviously relevant for us in the UK. Um, but that ORCID essentially anyway was not eligible to sign up to Safe Harbour um, and that the trustee certification scheme, which ORCID refer to in their privacy policy, is not formally recognised. However, it does demonstrate ORCID's data protection awareness. So essentially they, they were happy and confident that um, ORCID was on top of this. Um, and again, nothing in their, um, in their advice that said you absolutely shouldn't do this. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, we will move on now to the presentation from Dr. Richard Ikeda from the NIH. Just hand the presentation slides to you, Richard. Okay, hold on. Let me get it up. Let me get the. Uh, uh,
Okay, so can you see the slides? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Great, thanks. So thank you, Natasha. Um, NIH is not quite as far along as Sarah is in terms of uh, the integration of ORCID, but we're headed in that direction. I'd like to tell you a little bit about NIH to begin with and then how we're integrating ORCID IDs into our workflow. So the National Institutes of Health is the steward of, bio, of medical and bio, behavioral sorry research. To interrupt, sorry to interrupt, Richard. Um, it's just an option for you if you'd like to put your slides into presentation mode because we, we can see all the bar on the left-hand side. Okay. Uh, no, that's not it. Okay. Any luck or? Let me do. Let me try this. No, that's gonna. Yeah. We can still read them if it's a problem. Um, the one that's showing at the moment is slide seven. Slide seven? Yes. That's interesting because I've got the first slide, the second slide up in my... Ah. It's with me in the show. Okay. Let's try this again then. Ah, yes, that's, that's better. Now we are looking at slide two. Okay. There may be a there may be a delay as you move them along. Okay, you're seeing slide two. Okay, that was interesting. Uh, okay, so hopefully we, this is showing the full slide. Uh, yes, we can we can see the full slide in the center and then we see the bar on the left. So we can still read your slides. It's just okay. Let me yeah, get it's fine. Just continue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So as I said, the National Institute of Health is the steward for medical and bio behavioral research for the United States. Its mission is to pursue science. Uh, in terms of fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior in living systems and to apply this knowledge, scientific knowledge, to extend healthy life and to reduce the burden of illness. So how do we do this? Well, as a part of the United States government, we're buried within, a, a, within an administration or a hierarchy, which means we're part of the, the, the Department of Health and Human Services and we're one of uh, 11 agencies within the department. The National Institutes of Health, though, is in itself uh, pretty complex. The important part of, the, of our name is that we're the National Institutes, plural, of health. And as you can see from this slide, we've got 27 different institutes with different missions in terms of, of their, uh, their focus for health and science, anywhere from uh, basic science with the National Institute of General Medical Sciences to National Institute of Aging to the National Cancer Society or National Cancer Institute, National Eye Institute. So we all have our individual missions. Uh, the NIH in itself has two missions. Its first is to do research within its own campus, which is shown on the left-hand side of this slide. And we have on campus about 6,000 uh, active scientists working on their own research projects. And they uh, and we spend about 10% of the NIH budget on intramural research. However, 90% or actually 80% of our budget goes out to support research at institutions uh, across the nation and across the globe. We support currently about 4,000 different institutions, be it there, be there, be it universities, uh, research institutions, hospitals, etc. And we have about 300,000 scientists supported on these research grants and it amounts to about 80% of the NIH budget. What this means is that the NIH gets about 100,000 applications a year. We fund about 13,000 of those on a competitive basis and another 37,000 or so on a continuing basis. So we have quite a big portfolio of funded uh, research grants that go out to the different uh, 
universities and hospitals and research institutes. Um, you can see here in this slide our operating budget, which amounts to $32 billion a year. Research projects uh, amount to 55% of that budget. We then have intramural research, research contracts, research centers, and we also have training, research training, career development, and research management support. But I think what's important to this topic is how do we use or capture or get identifiers and how will we envision using it? So as I said uh, previously, we're not as far along as Sarah is in terms of, of collecting and using ORCID IDs. Our initial attempt was to bring in, well, let's back up a second. Uh, to use and to apply to NIH, you have to create a personal profile when you get a, uh, a login to the NIH system. And since I couldn't use someone else's profile, I had to use my own profile, which isn't com complete. But this is what it looks like within the system. We collect personal uh, inf information, including name and ID, the demographics, your employment, uh, whether you've served as a reviewer in your education. Uh, we do this because it's easier for us to associate all your applications and grants to a person profile instead of trying to track person profile through each individual application. This has served us well in terms of being able to automate processes, including our, our recently rolled out assist function, which allows for people to apply online. And by logging into that application system, we can pre-populate personal information from the ID that's used. Well, that's a long-winded introduction. Uh, but what we have here in this left-hand corner, the personal profile, is a person ID which NIH assigns, and since NIH is a little older than ORCID, our profile, our profile IDs go back a little farther. We have the ability to collect an ORCID ID, but currently we collect it from a profile system called Science CV. And this was originally envisioned as a federal, for the U.S. government, a federal profile system which would allow uh, scientists and researchers to put their profile in at one point and then allow each of the agencies to download their CV or biography without having them having uh, additional information added. Its adoption, however, hasn't been going very quickly, so we're now looking into actually directly uh, accessing ORCID IDs and allowing our uh, researchers to populate them within the personal profile within the uh, NIH Commons itself. And so our vision is to try and use these to, to basically uh, demonstrate the effectiveness and impact of NIH-sponsored research. And just an example of what we can do now, uh, we've been using things such as the relative citation ratio, which measures how many times a uh, publication has been cited in relation to the citation rate for its own field. And this is important because we're trying to show that the impact of NIH grants of research is higher than the, than the norm. And so we do this by looking simply at those publications where we can get an association between the publication and the grant. This has been uh, simplified by a, uh, a requirement that, that PIs or principal investigators uh, on a grant actually must associate that grant number with the, uh, with the publication or risk losing funding. So this has allowed us to look at uh, publications uh, that cite grant support. And in this uh, example, what we see is that in PubMed, we have about a million and a half papers that cite NIH publications and about 12 million that don't. And the relative citation rate for NIH papers is slightly higher than it is for papers in general. So this is one of the demonstrations that, that uh, NIH funding uh, provides greater impact as a, uh, on the whole across most fields. We've also done things like this where we've looked at uh, productivity of an award of, of an awardee uh, as, as a function of the amount of funding they get from the NIH, as a function of either the research grant or the program project grant. And what you see is that there is uh, basically decreasing efficiencies that once you get to a certain level of funding, your productivity does fall off. And uh, we can do this for specific grants, specific grant types, but we'd like to, do, like to be able to do this kind of analysis in the one previously for 
publications by authors or principal investigators that are funded by NIH uh, across all of their publications, not just for those uh, works that are that are that cite NIH support. So right now we're early on in our uh, implementation. Uh, we are looking now to make sure that we have the authority to collect the ORCID IDs on a voluntary basis and we're also looking into whether we can mandate that or require it. I know that uh, other agencies are also on that track and it may become something that, that comes a decision for the federal government in general, but right now each, other, each U.S. agency is working on that independently. So that's just a quick uh, summary of what we've been doing and how we've been doing it and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, that was a very good um, talk and some really staggering figures in there and uh, great to see how you're thinking of using ORCID to demonstrate um, the impact and effectiveness of NIH research. Um, there aren't any questions in the question pod at the moment and we are coming up to towards the end of the webinar time. So I will just ask if anybody would like to ask a question, if they could type it into our question box now. We'll just give people a minute to do that. Okay, well, we, we haven't got any questions in there, but I think perhaps people will go away and think about some of the things they've heard in the presentations today. Uh, I have put up on the screen the contact details for myself and Nibuko, and if you have any questions or you would like to get uh, in touch with the speakers, perhaps via us, uh, please do send us an email. Um, and there's just a comment from Jason Gush um, is very impressed to see those RCR plots. <laughs> so I will thank very much our speakers for today, uh, Josh, Sarah and Richard uh, for their very uh, honest sharing and <laughs> of how they're integrating with ORCID and what their plans are for the future. And thank you very much for attending. Oh yes, and we will send out uh, a link to the recording of the webinar probably in about a week's time. So thank you everybody, goodbye or good night, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you Natalia.